So back in the day, things were different. So we had mainframes, which were very big and homogeneous. People would normally think about the workloads that they would need to run on those mainframes, would plan carefully, buy those things, and then run their workloads. And so these machines were very big. There were special people operating them. But the good news was that everything was homogeneous. So you, you knew the system that you were dealing with. You knew very well the applications that you were going to be dealing with. Somewhere about in the beginning of the 90s, end of 80s, this changed. And so people switched from mainframes, which were very, very big and expensive, to commodity computing and then later to, to virtual machines. This, of course, came with its own set of challenges. So now what we had to do, we had to slice and dice a large array of machines and think about which applications are running where, how are we dedicating resources to various customers, and then, of course, we had to build some slack, again, into the system so that in case some of these machines failed, and these were failing, much more frequently than mainframe components for various reasons. So we had to have some slack to make sure that if something happens, we can, again, shift workloads. Um, so now, the, the data center operators have different set of challenges where now we needed to think, okay, like, how do we keep the utilization high? How do we plan for varying capacity requirements where like people pop up pretty much randomly and say like, hey, this is Christmas and I'm running an e-commerce app, so I need, I expect five times the usual traffic, so please do something about it. And of course we had like different types of failures that we needed to be dealing with that are inherent to the suited systems. And then there was, there is no kind of standard way of developing and maintaining a distributed system. So what data center operators ended up with was a zoo of these systems that were developed in their own way. So everyone was reinventing a bicycle. And so everyone was facing different problems. And so here, what we're illustrating here is that although you have a, although the, the, the operator might have a sl slack in her data center, if something failed, she needed some manual action to make sure that things are back to normal. And so here is a screenshot from a, a real email from a very real company, which is one of the largest Mesos, right now they are the largest Mesos operators in the world. Uh, when this email was sent, it wasn't the case. And so what's happening here is that an operator sending a message saying like, hey, we rebooted this machine, and we, we, we aren't sure whether there were any production services running on, on, on that machine. And they're trying to trace the owners of the applications running on that machine to, to figure out whether this reboot affected their service or not. So of course, this is not a desirable situation, not a situation that any uh, data center operator wants to be in. So one of the fundamental and most important things that we learn as computer science students is that pretty much every problem in computer science can be solved by adding another level of indirection. There is a little um, kind of small text here is that, you know, this is true for everything except for those problems that are caused by too many indirections, but that's outside the scope of our talk today. So, enter Mesos. So, with, with Mesos, uh, introduced is this architecture where we have a highly available master and a set of agents and a bunch of coordinators or schedulers also known as frameworks that are running on top and if you really think about that what, what fundamentally this is is just this is an, another level of indirection and so the indirection that we have introduced here is that we have a Mesos master which is a scheduler itself and it is dealing with raw resources However, it has no knowledge or, or understanding of the actual applications that are running on, on, on the resources that it manages. And it kind of outsources the business logic application specific scheduling and resource allocation decisions to another level, which are the coordinators or the schedulers. So the idea here is that no machine in the data center should be 
special and we should treat machines as cattle, not pets. And by doing so, we can allow various configurations of which, which application is used by which machine. And the big difference, fundamental difference here is that these decisions can now be taken by software as opposed to uh, a human. So in essence, what Mesos allows one to do is to treat entire data center as a new, uh, as, as a new form factor. So before we were used to dealing with mainframes, then machines, then phones, tablets. What we're thinking is that there is a new form factor, a new platform that we should be thinking about when we're developing our applications, and that platform is the data center itself. Hello, so, yeah, so as Artem alluded to in his previous slide that it's possible now with missiles that missiles gives you this nice level of abstraction that allows it, a data center operator to view this entire cluster as one big computer. So let's take a step back. From now on till the end of the slide, I would be referring to the old world where you use static partitioning as just the old world and a missiles as the a new world. Fair enough? So if you actually have a look at all the problems that the a data center operator has to face, these problems need to be tackled by an operator irrespective of whether they use the old world or the a new world of missiles. It's possible though that some of the problems are much easier to tackle now, but there might be some problems like debugging, which might be much more harder to tackle with missiles. Or there might be a new class of problems like a resource homogeneity that didn't even exist in the old world. So what we would be doing is we would be going over all of these points mentioned in this slide one by one and seeing how, the, how it actually compares, meaning how do we actually compare our things with the old world and the new world. So let's start with deployment. So what does it mean for a deployment in the old world compared to the new world? So, if we have a look at deployment, we can subdivide it into two main problems. You need to deploy your source of truth, that is a missiles, and the metascheduler like Aurora and Marathon. And the second part of the problem is, how do you deploy the applications themselves? So, there is a common misconception in the community that if you have a VMs, you have already solved the problem of a cluster management. It's not the case. You still need to use a, a cluster management software like Chef or Puppet to deploy a missiles. Once you have successfully deployed the thing that deploys other things, then comes the second bit, meaning now you want to deploy the actual applications themselves. But that is now a much more easier problem, meaning you already have meta frameworks like Aurora and Marathon which allow you to do that. So roughly speaking, the problem of deployment is almost the same in the old era as well as the new era, except that in this new era, things are a bit more powerful, meaning you get a dynamic placement for free, meaning in the old world when there was static partitioning as a service owner, I used to identify some set of nodes and my service only used to deploy on those particular nodes. But now with a missiles, it's a bit more intelligent, meaning it does a dynamic placement based on the needs of the scheduler. So you are getting a dynamic placement for free. So moving ahead, now you were able to deploy your applications, but what about the dependency of the application themselves? Meaning if I have an application A and it has like three other dependencies and if it gets deployed to some other node, how do we 
manage those dependencies. And that's why we invented a containers, right? So you, sh you should be fine with using image formats like a Docker, AppSeed, and you should be able to bundle all your app dependencies in this container, and then ask Mesos to run those workloads. As a matter of fact, with Mesos 0.28, we introduced this cool concept called a unified containerizer that allows you to run a Docker and AppSeed images natively. By natively, I mean you don't have a dependency on the Docker daemon or the Rocket runtime. You can just use the Mesos containerizer to launch Docker images. And it's it's a huge win for the community. You, you no longer have to face the instability that gets posted on the community more often that a Docker is not stable, a Docker is not doing this, blah, blah, blah. So you get all this stuff for free. So let's move on. So after a deployment, the next big challenge that operators have to face is the problem of monitoring. How do you monitor that your cluster is running fine? In the new world, relying on traditional monitoring-based tools that just do host-based monitoring won't actually work because now you have dynamic placement of workloads, meaning my workloads can be moved across instances. However, in the previous static partitioning world, I had some nodes and I knew that these nodes would only be running these particular workloads. But now, it's no longer the case. So you need to now monitor per application. And you need to adopt this new mentality of aggregate monitoring. Meaning, as a service owner or for that matter, a data center operator, I want the holistic view of my world as in the aggregated form, meaning I want to know how many instances of my application are running across the cluster. And if it's not equal to what I want to learn, I want to take some corrective action. I want to know how much is the usage slack in my cluster. And if there is no slack left, I would I want to take action as an operator, meaning I need to add more capacity to my cluster. The other bit which is extremely powerful that you can do with starting with a Mesos 1.1 is we introduce this new concept of task groups that are like the equivalent of pods in the Kubernetes world, which allows you to launch or run child containers as part of the main container. So you can have an adapter container or a sidecar container that actually does the monitoring that is it monitors the main container itself and its life cycle is closely tied to the main container. Another thing to note here is that the problem of monitoring is now much smaller in scope in the new world, meaning as a data center operator, my source of truth is a missiles and I can ask a missiles to get an idea of what the state of the cluster is. In the old world, it was like a needle in a haystack problem, meaning I first needed to identify what host was having this problem and then either move my workload from that host, but now you get all of that stuff for free. Moving on, so Mesos 1.0 introduced experimental support for event streaming in the V1 operator API. So this primitive allows a, a data center operator to get subscribed to new events happening on their cluster. So uh, currently we support four types of events. The first ones are task added and task updated, meaning every time a task is launched on your cluster, you would get an event on a persistent connection, which is the task added event. Every time the state of a task is changed, meaning it goes from staging to a running, or for that matter, from a running to finish, you would get another status update, meaning the task underscore updated event. In a similar vein, you also have the agent added and agent removed events. So every time a new agent is added on your cluster, you would get the agent added event. And every time an agent is removed from your cluster, you would get the agent removed event. And all the events are streamed on a persistent connection. There is a talk by Zidao tomorrow on this, so you guys might want to 
check it out it's pretty cool okay so moving on we now have to tackle the problem of logging so what does it mean in this new world the problem of logging is roughly the same meaning you still need to aggregate logs per application from various instances so you can use your old logging infrastructure as long as your logs get shipped to a, to a central location in addition to application log operators now have an insight into the overall health of the cluster meaning as an operator it's as easy for me to just have a look at the amazon master logs to see like what is the state of an application if an application owner is complaining to me that their application is not running fine so the scope of the problem is is reduced substantially in the new world mesos by a default stores the standard out and the standard error of containers in the task sandbox and you don't get any log rotation by a default which might be a problematic for some operators so to address this issue we introduced a custom logging support in o.27 now an application owner or for that matter a data center operator can write their own logging module if they are not happy with the custom or the default logging solution that amesos provides so amesos 1.2 would introduce new debugging capabilities which allow you to remotely attach to your remote to your running container and also launch processes in it so this functionality is the equivalent of a docker attach and a docker exec that exists in the a docker cli so that effectively means that as a application a developer i would now be able to launch a, a gdb instance inside my container and then see like why the performance of my container is being impacted if the need arises so the way it would be implemented is we would be adding these three calls to the agent api so we implemented this new v1 operator api and we divided it into two sub parts like the master api and the agent api the agent api is the things that you do on a particular agent so you have these a uh, three calls that you can do so the first call launch a nested container session is the equivalent of a docker exec what it means is that you can use this call and the agent would then launch a new nested debugging container for you and the new nested container would be launched in the same namespace and same a c group as the parent container so you can actually see what is going on in the parent container and you can launch new commands if the need be on that particular child debug container and the life cycle of that child debug container is associated with the http connection itself meaning if the connection breaks the processes are would be killed and the child a debugging container would also be killed the other, the other to call attach container input and attach container output are the equivalent of a docker attach meaning you can attach to the standard input of the entry point of the container and vice versa in the attach container output you can attach to the standard output of the child container hopefully these calls would soon be part of the meso cli2 as in the community we have been doing like substantial work to redesign the old meso cli we found that it had been neglected for far too long and it had some missing features so we are actively addressing them and hopefully soon we would have the meso cli to be a roughly functionally equivalent to the docker cli meaning you would get all the cool stuff like a docker ps for free which you can then use on the amesos containers so hopefully it would be pretty useful for all the operators and developers okay so now let's move on to a resource homogeneity now this is a problem that didn't exist in the old world at all so what this problem means is now i have a large cluster and not all nodes on that cluster are are equivalent you might have one a bpn node and you might have one a frail node and the and 
one CPU for a healthier node or a beefier node is not equal to one CPU from a, a frail node. And uh, similarly, one a memory unit is not the same in comparison to some other node. So, as an operator, you might want to tag the uh, resources on the agent with uh, labels uh, so that it gets passed on to the scheduler and the schedulers are able to make a good decisions on behalf on behalf of it and we are also thinking about introducing type a resources concept in a mesu itself meaning instead of cpu being just a string we would actually make it strongly typed meaning it would be like a cpu info with like more information about the resource itself Moving on, so in the old era, you had these uh, VMs that could actually grow and shrink as per the application needs. But now you have uh, containers and you get like stronger isolation. So your container would be killed if you exceed your uh, resource uh, limits. So this is like a fundamental uh, mindset change that a, a data center operator needs to tell the application a developer that you need to size your containers beforehand or they would be killed. Which is not like, when I started out, it wasn't that obvious to me because when you have been a programming in the VM world, you just assume and take these things for granted. So it would need like some kind of a mindset change that we need to pass on. Okay, so planning for failure. So uh, this is an email that was sent by a database administrator to a, a data center operator. And what the DBA is saying to the a data center operator is, hey, I have to launch these two new uh, database instances. And can you tell me if these two instances are in different fault domains, meaning they don't belong to the same rack, same uh, switches and power feeds. The thing which is really unfortunate about all this is, it should be the uh, software which should be intelligent enough to take these uh, placement uh, decisions on behalf of you, and not human beings, because human beings are prone to error. It should be your uh, software that should be intelligent enough to handle all these uh, fault domains and make an intelligent decision on behalf of you. So, how do we handle host and rack failures in the new world? Failures are the norm, uh, rather than the exception when you are using a community hardware. So, if you are uh, getting paged uh, due to host or rack failures, inherently you are doing something wrong, meaning you are using some kind of static partitioning in which you are pinning your services to instances. Don't do that in the new world. The new world is supposed to make your life easier, not harder to deal with. You would like to work with service owners to ensure that they have proper settings on the load balancer so that you can handle and survive these host and rack failures. And of course, have some spare capacity to get around these failures. If you don't have spare capacity and your rack dies, you would be in a pretty bad state. Okay, so network failures. Always use the agent removal rate limit. If you don't use it and you have a network partition, it's very likely possible that you might lose all the agents on your cluster because the master does health checking with the agent and the default value is 75 seconds. So if your agent is partitioned away from the master for 75 seconds, the master would of course fully kill it if it returns back. So ensure that you have a proper value for the agent removal rate limit or you might lose your entire cluster. Okay, so Historically, a MISOS has like sort of defined a fixed policy for dealing with a network partition. Meaning, if I am the framework and I have a task which is running on a partition agent, 
if that task gets partitioned or if the agent gets partitioned, the master would send task underscore lost on behalf of me. Huh. So this is a really problematic because as a framework now, I have no way of determining when a task is definitely not running. Compare it with this scenario. Suppose I am an operator and I am updating my cluster. So I forcefully terminate an agent, it would fail health checks and the master would still send task underscore lost on behalf of me. So now as a framework, I just don't know whether if the task is not running, maybe it's running, and how do I go about handling this? So we introduced this new capability in a 1.1 that allows a framework to opt into this new partition aware feature. So as a framework, if I say that I want to have this partition aware capability, the MSO master would send these additional task states as status updates back to the scheduler. So in the new world, if the agent is partitioned away from the master, the master would first send a task unreachable to the framework. If in the future the agent comes back again, the master would send a task running for the task if it's still active. This allows a framework to now make sure so that it knows that, yeah, if it gets a task gone, it's sure that, okay, this task can't actually come back again. Okay, so plan downtime and maintenance. So I remember like some slides back, I actually showed you that email about a, a database administrator emailing Dan. To, to uh, get around those use cases, this was introduced a maintenance of primitives to So a miss was introduced a maintenance of primitives like long back, I think it was in 0.25. So as a, a framework, I would be extremely mad if a, a data center operator takes down an agent accidentally. I might have a workloads which are critical and my SLS would be impacted. So a get around this, a missiles has introduced this new a maintenance a primitive which allow an operator to effectively say to the missiles master that I want to take down this agent for a maintenance. What does this mean is, if you see the figure, initially your agent is in the up mode, meaning it's active. Now an operator can say, I want to schedule maintenance on this agent. As soon as the operator does that, the agent goes into a drain mode. When the agent goes into a drain mode, the master sends inverse offers back to the framework, indicating the unavailability of the agent. So as a framework, now I can decide based on the unavailability if I want to move my workloads from this agent to some other agents. So this effectively means that now as a framework, I get the choice that I can opt into this, meaning there is a way that taking down an agent might not impact my SLA as it used to do in the old world. With this, I would hand it over to Art and Thor until the end of the talk. The next thing is the capacity planning, where before we had to manually partition our cluster and decide which workloads are running where. Today, Mesos provides a quota mechanism where uh, an operator can set certain quota for a particular role, and then Mesos will ensure that, that frameworks that subscribe to, to the master as that role will get that much of resources ahead of everyone else. <clears throat> Similar to quota, there is a mechanism for res reservations, which uh, works the same way, except that reservations are tied to a particular agent, whereas quota is across the cluster and in case of quota, it's Mesos that makes the placement decisions for the framework. Um, the last thing that uh, that's, that's new is the persistent volume. So this is a, a mechanism for creating
persistent volumes from disk resources. And the idea here is that the lifetime of those resources that are created when launching the task actually exceeds the lifetime of a task itself. Which means that now we can have, if we're running something like Cassandra, and for whatever reason our executor terminates, Mesos will hold on to the, to, the, to the volume that this Cassandra framework has used and created, and it will offer it back to the same framework when it resubscribes. So this, this, this primitives allow us to run stateful uh, workloads on Mesos, things like databases. So there are, so these are the four principles of the fault tolerance as prescribed by uh, Tannenbaum. And uh, we believe that Mesos checks all of the boxes here. So it allows you, actually it mandates uh, the way the primitives are presented to the user, they kind of mandate for the framework developer to, to build systems that are highly available, reliable, are safe in terms of uh, they prevent operator from doing mistakes to the extent which is possible and are uh, easier to maintain. So you had to take two things away from this talk, so that would be that no machine in the data center should be special. You should be able to use all the data center resources interchangeably. So unicorns are not always a good thing. Sometimes we won't just ship. And the other thing is that we should outsource as many decisions to software as we can. So we have to let software schedule software, handle software failures, and then take care of utilization and also help us when it comes to maintenance. Thank you.